So thank you for the uh, introduction. Um, thank you to the Metcalf Institute for uh, inviting me today. It's a, a great privilege. I've never had an opportunity to be to a, a Metcalf uh, event before, so this is, this is really unique in uh, getting researchers and media together to talk about um, you know, some of the key issues that are facing the region. So the Council of the Great Lakes region. Um, we were formally created last year, uh, launched in Cleveland. Um, we have uh, uh, an office in Cleveland at the Canada U.S. Law Institute at uh, Case Western Reserve University, as well as the Mowat Center at the University of Toronto. We are a binational nonprofit um, uh, that's looking to deepen collaboration across the border and across sectors, um, you know, with respect to building the next economy in the Great Lakes, looking at environmental protection issues, and looking at uh, workforce development and labor mobility issues in the Great Lakes. So how did we come about? Back in 2011, there was a conference in the Detroit Windsor area, the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Regional Summit, uh, brought together, you know, three to four hundred different leaders from around the region in terms of government and private sector, academia, the nonprofit community, and labor. Um, and the purpose of the summit was to really delve deep into, you know, some of the issues that we're facing the region in terms of economic growth and climate change and other social development issues. And, you know, as with a lot of regions um, across the border, you know, there are no shortage of things that are going on. Um, but I think one key theme that came out of the event was that, you know, while there's lots of great things going on, um, there's a real mix uh, in terms of, you know, good things happening in the Upper Great Lakes or the Lower Great Lakes or on the U.S. side of the border, on the Canadian side of the border. But more often than not, we weren't linked up as much as we could be on a, on a binational basis particularly around issues where there, where there really is common cause. Um, and as a result of that, um, a number of people sort of came away from the summit with a belief that um, we need to find a way of filling that void. Um, and ultimately, the Council of the Great Lakes region was established to try and bring those different partners together, government, private sector, labor, nonprofit, academia, um, to start looking at some of these big issues uh, on a binational basis, um, you know, in a region that is just so fundamentally important um, to the U.S.-Canada relationship. You know, when we look at it economically, you know, if it was a country, it would be the fourth largest economy in the world in GDP, GDP terms. That's not insignificant, so that's the largest economy behind the U.S., China, and Japan. If it was a country, it would be the 12th largest country in terms of population, 105 million people. Um, you know, there's 46 million people, roughly 30 percent of the U.S. and Canadian workforce that rely on the Great Lakes for jobs. Another 40 million, equal number, rely on the Great Lakes for drinking water. In terms of uh, research and innovation, upwards of 29 percent of R&D uh, and 77 percent of R&D in Canada is done within the Great Lakes region. So a significant contribution in terms of research and development. You know, in terms of trade between the two countries, you know, upwards of you know 280 to 300 uh, billion dollars a year in trade is done, um, you know, within the Great Lakes region. That's roughly 40 percent of trade between the U.S. and Canada, and that principally happens along the seaway and over four bridges. Uh, and of those four bridges, uh, it really happens over one, and that's the current bridge between the Detroit, uh, Detroit city, and, and the city of Windsor. Um, so it's an incredibly important region economically, and even um, as much uh, on the environmental side. You know, it's it's. I think it's fair to say that, you know, it is one of the richest regions in the world uh, from a from an ecosystem standpoint and from a diversity standpoint. Um, but I think when we look at its its vastness and its greatness from an environmental uh, aspect, you know, we often lose sight of. And Drew gave a great presentation about you know water levels and water quantity. But we, we, we forget that the Great Lakes, only 1% of the Great Lakes are renewed on an annual basis. 1%, which is renewed by precipitation runoff and groundwater. 99% of the Great Lakes are glacial water. It's very quick to forget that because they are so vast, but it is a really a finite resource. Um, and so when you look at um, you know, where you can come together as a region to look at some of these issues, um, you know, Drew and his team and working with Environment Canada have really been working hard to delve into the science around evaporation, precipitation, climate change modeling, and, and really trying to get better at the science. Um, you know, as a council, what we wanted to do, because of the 13-year 
um, low that he referred to was get into a bit of the economics, um, you know, around what would a low water level future look like in the Great Lakes and what would be some of the impacts. So we put together, you know, a plausible scenario where we would see, again, um, you know, a long period of, of low water levels across the whole system. You know, and our findings were quite significant and sobering. I think between now and 2030, you know, our estimates, and these are all in current day figures, uh, estimated economic impacts, you know, in the range of uh, $9 billion. And between now and 2050, upwards of $18 billion. And when we look at the various sectors um, that are mostly impacted, and I have a report here, just a couple of reports here if you want to take them away, but they're accessible online as well. You know, uh, Kate had mentioned recreational boating and fishing. You know, again, you know, when you look at that sector, people don't think of it as, as such an important sector, but it is the one that it would be the hardest hit. Um, you know, in our, in, our, in our modeling, in our assessment. So when you look at recreational boating and fishing, you know, upwards, there would be an, an economic impact of upwards of $6.6 .6 uh, U.S. dollars US dollars through to 2030 and $12.8 billion through to 2050. Um, so on an industry that contributes so much to economic growth, the potential impact of, of living with a low water future, um, you know, is quite significant. Again, commercial shipping and harbors, um, when you look at the amount of traffic that happens along the seaway, you know, at potential economic impacts of almost $2, $2 billion through to 2030 and um, $1.9 billion through to 2050. Hydroelectric generation, $950 million uh, total through 2030, roughly $3 billion through to 2050. Uh, residential waterfront property values, um, roughly $794 million through to 2030. 976 million through 2050. The interesting thing about the property values is for this study is we were able to generate um, a, an assessment of impacts in Ontario because in Ontario we have a centralized system for, for collecting property values so we were able to generate that number. We didn't have access to the data on the US side because it's, it's kept at the county level more difficult to access. So that is a good um, lead in to say these numbers are extremely conservative. Um, we didn't have access to some uh, data points that if we did, the numbers would be just as large, uh, just you know, that much bigger. Um, we also didn't take into account some of the ecological services impacts or impacts on First Nations um, you know, around the region. So the numbers, um, as I said before, they're significant and they're conservative. Um, and this really was a first attempt to try and you know, pull data from the work that Drew has been doing and others have been doing and to try and put that into some economic terms and principally because we think that it's important to start, you know, a conversation in the Great Lakes about how we start thinking about <coughs> adaptation and building more resilient infrastructure, more resilient cities and mitigation um, because we can't wait for the science to be absolutely perfect. You know, the, the science itself will always be evolving as we get more data, as we get better at science. But I think from a policy standpoint, and that's sort of my area of expertise, you have to start giving guidance um, you know, on those four to five year time frames um, that were uh, alluded to earlier. And so you know, we hope that this will be a contribution you know, to a discussion um, across the Great Lakes in both Canada and the United States at the state provincial level and at the municipal level about how we need to start thinking about climate change uh, not only in terms of environmental terms, but potential economic impacts. Um, the next phase of this work will start delving a little deeper into the cost-benefit analysis of various interventions in terms of adaptation, mitigation, resiliency. And, um, you know, again, we hope that will further, um, you know, draw out some, um, you know, salient points that we, we all need to be start, starting to think about in terms of planning for uh, uh, a future of, um, you know, low water levels, you know, if we were uh, to be faced with that scenario. And we, we, we absolutely think that that is a very plausible scenario given the level of vulnerability um, that there is in the modeling today. And I would just conclude that um, while a lot of these impacts, you know, certainly affect the region as a whole, there are certainly certain parts of the Great Lakes region that would be disproportionately hit. Um, so, for example, if you look at hydroelectric generation, you only, you only have to look at the Niagara River, the Welling Canal, and Lake Ontario shores where a lot of hydroelectric generation exists. 
you know, and, and so that area would face a disproportionate um, impact as a result of its reliance on hydroelectric generation. Um, you know, Lake Erie Harbors, for example, um, can see added uh, impacts compared to other jurisdictions because of dredging and maintenance costs. Um, you know, when we look at you know, the, on the shipping industry, iron ore shippers and producers who have a strong presence around Lake Superior, um, you know, could face losses that are disproportionate to, you know, other commodities that are shipped in different parts of the region. Um, so we're, you know, we're quite excited about the report and the work um, that we're doing in this area, and we hope that, um, you know, to Kate's point again, you know, um, you know, bringing people together from government and private sector, the nonprofit and academia communities, I think we can start finding ways of having conversations where we're able to take the border and the politics out of the region, and I think that is that in some respects has created, you know, a barrier to. Um, having an integrated conversations about some of the unique challenges that we face and um, you know we're uh, as I said we're, we're new we're a year old but you know hopefully um, you know some of the, the, the research we're doing and the conversations we're looking to start um, you know will ignite a, a different kind of level of collaboration in the, in the Great Lakes region so I'll finish there um, I know that I'm the last speaker and that's like just being before lunch um, so I'm happy to uh, join my colleagues in answering any questions that you may have. Thank you.